I think, very Annie Mary opens of selected cinemas today, as does when Brendan met Trudy. One of the biggest current debates in culture is whether the beliefs and activities of an artist should influence our appreciation of their work. Does it matter that the poet Philip Larkin kept a stash of porn mags, or the two women involved with Ted Hughes committed suicide? This question of to what extent we should read between the lines is posed in its most extreme form by a new exhibition at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. Taking a Positions features the work of artists who remained in Germany during the Third Reich. They include Arno Breker, a sculptor so admired by Hitler that the Führer gave him a castle as a 40th birthday present. But does a Nazi artist always produce Nazi art? To what extent should historical knowledge cloud our eyes when we look at work from this period? Well, this is not a survey of Nazi sculpture. There are some pieces that are Nazi and some pieces that are not. We could have done a huge survey of Nazi work, but that in many ways would have been very boring. And I wanted people to be interested. I think most of the pieces here have aesthetic quality. And here you're realizing that there's a range of sculptors who are making a point, but they had to make it in a quite underhand way. It's been a question for me in terms of making the exhibition. To what extent do you need to say, this is a piece by a bad guy, this is a piece by a good guy. And we've put that material, as it were, in the catalogue, but I wanted people here to really look. And I think, and I'm surprised, that more than I had expected, I feel that you can tell those people who were really complicit with the regime and those who weren't. It's very hard to be black and white about Nazi art, and certainly, it was deeply inconsistent, the artistic policy. So it's very hard to make generalizations. It does make a difference. And the more you know, the, it makes a difference. Um, and it can make you feel uneasy. But I think that's good. It tests you in relation to how does art work with life. Taking positions of the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. Jermaine Greer, this is one of the big questions. How much does it matter what they believe, what they did? Does this exhibition give answers? No, but uh, all the art of the 1930s and 40s had, uh, well, all, quite a lot of the best art of the period was fascist in a sense. Everybody believed in eugenics then, for example. Everyone believed in rational forms of state structure. They had to find out how they wouldn't work, how they were fundamentally unjust. That was a very costly lesson that got learned. But you would have to ditch Yeats if you decided that somebody with illiberal attitudes couldn't be a great artist. And it wouldn't occur to me to ditch Yeats for a moment. The real problem with this sculpture is it's bad. It's just plain bad. I don't care if it was done by angels. It was angels on a bad day. It's dreadful stuff. It is, it is, um, again, I have to use the same sort of words. It's both brutal and sentimental. It's. Uh, extremely bombastic. The figures are insisting on their own uh, archetypal character when they're not archetypal at all. They're weakly constructed as constructions. They have no inner balance. Their notion of strength consists of doing things like clenching fists and, and wrinkling brows. It's got nothing to do with the, with the actual weight of the figure. Everything refers to archaic Greece. They're all versions, or to Rome, which was again another fascist period. Uh, so you've got uh, collapsing gladiators. You've also got Tom of Finland, um, I think. There's one of the male nudes is so Tom of Finland, it looks like it should be on the cover of a gay porn mag. And then the other which, one which, is... Well, which would be an interesting thing to have come from that period. Paul Molly, <laughs> it did seem to me it's a fascinating challenge to the way we look at art. The really brave thing would be to have had no captions, no catalogue, and just send yes. everyone in and say, we'll tell you afterwards whether you like the Nazi uh, one. Well, I think you'd still get a sense in the Nazi period that they, they, they were like mannequins. Every kind of detail and, and robustness is taken away. To the extent that even when you look at a body, a, a well-made sculpted body, you, 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 it's about the mind still. The, the, these things, it was not about the mind. It was definitely just about the body. Uh, the Breaker guy, that's the, uh, Sp Albert Speer's uh, favourite, and of course Hitler's favourite, his, his pieces were extraordinary because ultimately they, kind of they, they look like the kind of guys that would accompany Gra uh, Graham Norton out onto his set or the kind of statues you'd find in Elton John's garden. Extraordinary um, genitalia with the most flourishy pubic hair. Uh, I mean, you take away the, the context of these things and just view them in a, in a little room in Leeds, and they were kind of rather sad. I'm sure if mighty in Munich in the 30s and 40s, they were incredibly intimidating, but here they just looked incredibly camp. You, oddly enough, looking at the genitalia, which was most amusing, not only did you notice that the testicles were also used elsewhere in another great Nazi design, that of the Volkswagen Beetle, 
very similar design, so in a way we were all driving around for 30 years in Hitler's testicle. But also, what, what you also noticed, what, <laughs> rather fabulously, the only piece of really kind of surreal abstract art you got in Germany in, the, in, in, that, in that period was the swastika. And you realize it's like a cubist penis. Because I thought what was interesting is the combination of the, the genitalia, genitalia on the men and the women, no genitalia at all, completely, you know, turned into mannequins like action men. But on the men, you know, incredible poetry applied to the genitalia. And there's a fantastically small and massy English woman as well in one of the galleries. Rowing Tom Paul, it's interesting, isn't it? We're, we're so used to looking at writer's work and we, we're better at reading that. We look for the clues to their political beliefs. When you're forced to look at a sculpture, it is much harder, isn't it? Well, it, it, it is, but we've, we've got to realise that, you know, some of these uh, artists were close to the Nazis, others weren't. I, I got very interested in, in, in one um, sculptor, Jared Marks, who, who's got a Prometheus um, uh, bound from, from 1948, because it just doesn't cover the Third Reich. And then one that fascinated me, and this was an artist who was part of Bauhaus. They were all radical artists. Four of them died in Auschwitz. They were socially committed, brilliant um, gr group of artists. And it's of a, a, a female, standing female, um, w who's putting on a bathing cap. And her hands are like this over her ears. And I thought, absolutely brilliant. This is the way to do an apolitical sculptor that's actually political because it's like the monkey say hear no evil see no evil i thought that was very very brilliant there's another sculptor of a, a, a woman a man advancing uh, hands like this as if they're going to be bound uh, that was put on show and tell immediately banned tell by me the though, Nazis. tell me though because you you've often in your writing dealt with the question of what people believe and whether it matters and you've been critical of people who had um, extreme political beliefs. Did you check the political position of these sculptors before deciding whether you liked their work? Um, well, no, I, I, I went round it and, I, and I, I started to get interested in some and then I went round with the curator and I was dating them as well and in fact that, I spotted an inconsistency yeah. in the dating and the, in, in, in the catalogue and what this uh, uh, does is it forces you to think about dates, about politics, about the biography of artists and but also to you, think about... Could you have liked to work by a Nazi though? Um, what I think about the, the, the ones about the, 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 the Nazis, these, these big, um, big male figures, is, as, as indeed the, 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 the um, catalogue says, there's a tremendous anxiety and uncertainty and lack of confidence in them. There's something just unformed, half-baked about them. So they're very interesting as social statements. And so what you've got, as Shakespeare says, you know, art tongue-tied by authority, sometimes sneaking up to authority and other times definitely standing uh, against it in a very subtle way. So I think it's an important exhibition. I haven't seen anything like it. And we, we're well familiar with writers on, on, on the Soviet bloc, how they code their statements. And one's got to read it like no, that. Absolutely. And I thought it was an unusual exhibition. Tom Pullen takes the last position on Taking Positions, which is at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. In the food business, the word light is used on the packaging to persuade you that something is beneficial. However, when employed by critics and professors of poetry, light often implies that the verse is worse for you than the real high fiber stuff. The best-selling exponent of light verse in Britain is Wendy Cope. His 1986 collection, Making Cocoa for Kingsley Amis, its title provided by a dream the writer had, first showed her talent for parody and comedy and her interest in trying out various verse schemes. Her recurrent themes included the unreliability of men and the difficulty of writing. Cope's third collection, If I Don't Know, is published this week. And while poetry remains tough, men seem to have become easier. This started from a painting. It's a nude study by Vanessa Bell of a woman, a paid model. And this woman in the painting doesn't look very attractive, and she doesn't look very happy either. And I imagined what she would have to say about it. It's called The Sitter. Depressed and disagreeable and fat. That's how she saw me. It was all she saw. Around her, yes, I may have looked like that. She hardly spoke. She thought I was a bore. Beneath her gaze, I couldn't help but...